Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm part of the faculty here at Brookdale, where I co-direct the creative writing program. I'm very excited today to be talking with David Gran. Um, he is the author of the book, The Lost City of Z, A Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon, which actually just hit the New York Times bestseller list in this number one spot. And also a new book, which is just out, called The Devil and Sherlock Holmes, Tales of Murder, Madness, and Obsession, which is a collection of essays that have been published in The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, and The New Republic. Um, so David, welcome. Thank it you for having me on the show. It's a pleasure to have you on the show. Congratulations, as I was saying earlier, on number one on the New York Times was, bestseller list. That was a very happy day. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying they actually call you. you they do. The they call you. The, uh, the publisher calls you. And to be honest, even in one's delusions of grandeur, I did not ever expect to hit number one. On the New York Times, <laughs> uh, bestseller list. <laughs> uh, well, it is much deserved. It's a great, great book. Thank you. Um, for people who haven't read it, um, mm -hmm. could you maybe tell us a little bit about what the Lost City of Z is? Yeah, sure. It, it's a story about uh, kind of the last great uh, Victorian Edwardian explorer, mm -hmm. a man named uh, Percy Harrison Fawcett. Mm -hmm. He was very famous in his day, now somewhat forgotten. He had helped inspire Conan Doyle's novel, The Lost World. Mm -hmm. And he had explored the Amazon uh, for the first part, early part of the 20th century. And back mm -hmm. then, the Amazon really remained the last large blank space on the map. Mm -hmm. It's about the size of the continental United States. And the jungle was so unexplored in that day that the countries of Brazil, uh, Bolivia, and Peru didn't even know where their borders were. Mm -hmm. So they needed someone to come in and map it. And they had a hired... Uh, Fawcett to do it. And Fawcett came in, began to map the borders, mm -hmm. and during that time, he began to gather clues that led him to believe uh, that there was an ancient civilization in the middle of the jungle. And eventually- that lost city. This lost city, uh -huh. and which he called rather cryptically, uh, the city of Z. Mm -hmm. And uh, his theory was very radical because most people believe that the jungle was too inhospitable a place to sustain a large complex mm -hmm. society, that it was just, the conditions were too brutal. Now, a lot of people would think, well, you know, there's there's lots of, it's a jungle, there'd be lots of fruit and animals right. hopping about, right? Right, and it's- Not it's, reality, right? Right, <laughs> one of the things that happens is, uh, one of the leading archeologists of the 20th century coined the phrase of the Amazon, referring to it as a counterfeit paradise, mm -hmm. that despite all this flora and fauna, it's somewhat inimical to human life. And mm -hmm. part of it is, uh, there are certain kind of predators. The most deadly predator is actually mosquitoes, which mm -hmm. transport all these diseases. But also what happens is because there are so many um, plants mm -hmm. uh, and trees competing for nutrients in the soil, uh, lots of places of the soil get depleted of nutrients. And so the theory was it was very hard to grow crops. Mm. And so you couldn't have enough crops to have a large population. But Foss had gathered all these clues going through. Uh, he was once in the Bolivian floodplains. He, he climbed up this large earth mound. He saw mm -hmm. something sticking out of the dirt. He scratched it. He plucked it out of the dirt. And it was a shard of pottery, an ancient brittle piece of mm -hmm. pottery. And everywhere he looked, he saw other shards of pottery. And, be and between these large earth mounds, he saw what he believed were these causeways or roadways buried underneath the foliage. So finally, in 1925, he set out to find this place, which he called the City of Z. And he brought with him two companions, his son, his older mm -hmm. son, Jack, Jack's best friend, Raleigh Rimel, and off they headed into the jungle. Uh, and then they disappeared without a trace. And then for years to come, people would search for them or search for evidence of the city, and they would die or disappear. Uh, and this went on uh, all the way up into the present. Uh, in, in just a few years ago, there was a large expedition, Brazilian expedition, that tried to find clues to what happened. Uh, mm -hmm. They were ultimately um, taken into captivity uh, by one of the tribes in the area mm -hmm. uh, before escaping. So uh, the story of the Lost City of Z is about trying to tell what happened to Fawcett uh, and, and also trying to solve this mystery of could there really have been an ancient civilization? Mm -hmm. And eventually I followed uh, Fawcett's trail into the jungle uh, mm -hmm. to try to gather clues. Well, that's actually what I was going to ask you about, and we won't, we won't give the ending <laughs> of the book away, although it was great. <laughs> um, but it is very much as well your story, too. And mm. as somebody who is a journalist, who I'm, I'm mm. guessing is, is quite used to separating himself from the story, yeah. there's also the story of, of David Grand, you yeah. know, New York City writer who decides he's going to 
<laughs> follow Fawcett's right. route in no, the one jungle. Of my, my more foolish moments in life. <laughs> uh, Did you expect that to happen? No. I, when I began the story, I really thought that I would uh, really began as a biographical quest, mm -hmm. and I thought I would tell Fawcett's story, and then I would tell the story of all these other people who had searched for him, yeah. including this recent expedition. So I thought, well, I have a contemporary hook for this story, and I have this old mm -hmm. story. And I began in a way that was very suited to my paltry physical attributes, which was going to libraries around the world. And I was trying to track down diaries and letters. Mm -hmm. And as I gathered more clues, I became more consumed with the mystery myself. And eventually I had gone and I tracked down Fawcett's granddaughter, um, who lived in Wales. Mm -hmm. And when I was at her house telling her about my interest, eventually she had said to me, well, you know, do you want to know what happened yeah. to my grandfather? And I said, well, you know, sure, if at all possible. And she had led me into this back room where she had this old trunk. Mm -hmm. And in that old trunk, as I describe in the book, were all these old books. And the bindings were breaking apart and they were covered in dust. They were held together by these little ribbons. And I asked her what they were. And she said, these are my grandfather's secret diaries and log books. And these held enormous clues, both to the mystery of his life and the mystery of his death. And mm -hmm. for me as a writer, they really were my kind of Z. And it was really at that point um, that I kind of said, you know, maybe I have so much information, I became enough consumed in the mystery, what would happen if I uh, went into the jungle? If you went into the what was it like? Because you were the first person to see these, these journals and, and such. They, the uh, you first know, journalist, yeah, correct? Yeah, they, they, they um, you know, they had been in the family, uh, but they had yeah. not, none of these materials were published and they had not been shared publicly. And, you know, like I said, they really were as a writer. And one of the themes of the book is that we all, in a way, have our Z. We all have these mm -hmm. elusive quests. And whether it's a biographical quest, whether it be a quest for a lost city. And as a writer, I'm always kind of looking, not necessarily for the perfect city, but the perfect story. Mm -hmm. And to find every piece of that story, mm -hmm. every clue, every brick that can build that story. And so for me, finding these diaries was an exhilarating experience. Sure. And um, to give you some sense, so to the lengths one goes, not only did I kind of go into the jungle, but um, one of the companions who went and disappeared was Fawcett, was this character named Raleigh Rimel, who mm -hmm. was a Fawcett's son, Jack's best friend. Mm -hmm. And I spent three years of my life trying to track down any letters or missives that he had written. I had all of Fawcett's papers and I had Jack's letters, including letters that they had sent from the jungle from their last expedition. Uh, they would uh, write uh, letters and give them to Indian runners who would carry them uh, out of the jungle. Mm -hmm. And it would take them weeks to get to an outpost. They'd be carried to another outpost. And a lot of these uh, dispatches that uh, Colonel Fawcett wrote, mm -hmm. um, Percy Harrison Fawcett wrote, uh, were then typed up on telegraph machines and blasted around the world. And so millions of people had followed this yeah. expedition. Because this was a really big deal in its Oh, day, it was right? a huge deal. I mean, if you, yeah. when I got interested in this, one of the things that hooked me was I plugged Fawcett's name into mm -hmm. these historical newspaper databases, and up came banner headlines in the New York Times, the mm -hmm. Washington Post, all, all around the world. And so everybody was kind of following this expedition. It was kind of like their version of Twitter back then. <laughs> and, um, and, uh, and then they vanished. And I was able to get all of Fawcett's papers yeah. and, and Jack's papers, but Raleigh remained this conundrum to me, this mystery. Mm -hmm. And he had siblings, but none of them had descendants or direct children. And so I checked their wills. I wrote to every Rimal in England I could find. Rimal had lived in LA for a little while. I wrote to, couldn't find anything. And finally, after three years, I had tracked down a cousin once removed who was in her 80s who lived outside of London called her up and said, are you related by any chance to, to Raleigh? Mm -hmm. She said, oh, yes, yes, I, Elsie, the mom, was my cousin. Or the, and, and then we chatted, and I was so happy. And I said, by any chance, do you have any of his um, letters home from the jungle? She said, oh, yes, I have them up in the attic. And uh, that really was a, a moment after three years. They sent a little shiver. <laughs> yeah, no, I did. And I had written about half the book at that point when that happened. Oh, wow. Yeah. Did you go back? Um, into the jungle? No. Uh, did you go back after you had already written that part and added? Oh yes. And oh, de oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, I redid, and it gave me a whole new sense of him, uh, and so I was so happy to find him. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. That's great. I wonder. You talk about um, as well that one of the themes of the book is sort of the theme of obsession mm -hmm. and how obsessed everybody mm -hmm. got with this. I mean, Fawcett. I mean, some people sort of 
called him sort of mad. He wasn't very nice to the people he traveled. No, you would not want to be. In, one of the reasons I wanted to get Raleigh's <laughs> papers is because Raleigh I could identify with the most. Because Raleigh <laughs> was kind of like me. He had no business being in the jungle. Fawcett um, was this tough, hard man, kind of could survive anything. And, I mean, he was his powers of endurance were so legendary that people almost thought he was immune to death. So the prospect mm -hmm. of him disappearing, nobody could ever wrap their mind around. For years, people Did thought he was like, wife. Did he, never get sick or something? He would never get sick. He almost had this kind of natural imperviousness yeah. to disease. And that led to a, a good deal of contempt for his companions mm -hmm. who got weak because he just couldn't have empathy. Mm -hmm. And he also, I think, to some level, saw weakness um, as a reflection of one's character. Mm -hmm. And then the other element was he just didn't want anything to get in his way. I mean, he wanted to get from A to B. And also some of his ruthlessness uh, on these expeditions, and he was tough, um, probably also helped his men survive because mm -hmm. you had to drive these men through the jungle. People would give up at any moment. Sure. And he would, on these earlier expeditions, before he disappeared in 1925, he led many expeditions in the jungle. And on these expeditions, usually half his men would die of wow. disease and starvation. And in fact, his party had a rule um, that uh, if you became too sick or ill, you would have to be abandoned left in behind. the jungle, left behind, because otherwise you would imperil uh, all the other people, everybody the else. Because you know they were going enormous yeah. distance, hacking through the wilderness. Uh, but it. they were obsessed, and it, and he was very much obsessed. And one of the themes of, of of the book is how his obsession by the end does become tinged with madness. Well, on that very perky note, yes. we're going to have to take a break. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but I'm talking with David Graham, um, New York Times bestselling author. Please join us after the break. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> yeah! This is Robert. Is, is Lewis next? This is how things could be if everyone realized that getting tested for colon cancer could actually keep them from getting it. Bring it on, Doc. It's one cancer you can avoid. You guys are great. Thank you. Thank you. Talk to your doctor about getting Thank tested. No, and no, for no, a free no, information no. kit, call 800-ACS-2345. This is the American Cancer Society. One means to rally Americans one by one. To a vision of America, lifting up poor but honest nations. To loving their people as our neighbors. And even stopping the next Sudan or Afghanistan. Step one in joining the campaign is signing up for the One Declaration. We believe that in the best American tradition of helping others help themselves. Now is the time to join with other countries. In a historic pact for compassion and justice. To help the poorest people in the world overcome AIDS and extreme poverty. Dimes are shiny and round. Nickels are also round. <laughs> Dollars are not round. Dollars are rectangles. What can I buy with two rectangles? A bus ride. Good job, honey. When you talk with your child, you build vocabulary. And learning starts long before school does. For more tips, go to bornlearning.org. For more information about resources in the tri-state area, call 800-216-0577. Hi, and welcome back to the Brookdale Visiting Writer Series show. I'm talking with David Grant, New York Times bestselling author and New Yorker writer. Welcome back. Thanks. Before the break, you were talking about, I think it was um, Raleigh, was that? Yes. And that it took you three years to find those letters? Three years. I was wondering, because I mean, usually it seems you publish as a New Yorker staff writer. Right. Um, were you expecting to be spending this much of your mm. life on this book? No, no. <laughs> and. And even with my New Yorker stories, I tend to go uh, through a little bit of a looking glass. I get pretty consumed with these stories. Uh -huh. But the story of the City of Z was the first story I had researched where, mm -hmm. as I went into it, I realized it really did not naturally fit the constraints of a shorter story. Mm -hmm. There were just too many places to go, too many doors that sure. kept opening up and too many tantalizing leads to chase down. Mm -hmm. And so it really became something much larger and, and bigger. Just and kind of exploded. Yeah, and, and you know, in, in every which way, whether it led me into the jungle, <laughs> I had really no business being in. Uh, I still got an extra insurance policy on my life. Did you really? I did, yeah. The magazine was actually pretty nice and helped with that, but I did, I took out a extra insurance policy mm -hmm. because, you know, I, I make light of it, and, and part of my uh, role in the in, the, in telling the book and inserting myself into mm -hmm. this story is, is 
is less to be about me than to allow a reader who isn't Fawcett. I mean, very few of us are Fawcett's, these kind of half-mad Victorian explorers who, <laughs> who would endure anything and uh, would leave their families sure. behind for years. And so it's a way to kind of let the reader see things uh, through my eyes as mm -hmm. well. And so the chapters alternate. And it, it also helps illuminate how the world has changed. I mean, mm -hmm. when Foss would go on these expeditions, they had no immunities for diseases. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had inoculations. And his men would perish left and right. Mm -hmm. And when I went, the biggest asset I had wasn't a GPS, but was, a, um, was immunities. I mm -hmm. got to take malaria pills and, and yellow fever mm -hmm. inoculations and also helped illuminate in many ways the way the jungle had changed and the conditions of many of the indigenous communities. Uh, one of the things I describe in my sections is uh, looking, out, uh, looking out and having, I brought Fawcett's letters with me, mm -hmm. and he would be describing in the same part, uh, hacking through wilderness uh, and the intensity of it, and I would look out in some of these parts and there'd be nothing there uh, because all the trees had been deforested. So, yeah. so part of the thing is to illuminate and give people a sense of how the world has changed, changed in, sure. in, in less than a century. Sure. How was the experience, because you actually retraced Fawcett's footsteps. Yes. How was that, once you did actually get into the jungle itself, did it change your attitude or your opinion of Fawcett in any way? Well, um, I certainly, it, it increased my sense of respect for what he went through <laughs> yeah. and uh, it gave me a better sense that I was not Fawcett, uh, though I kind of knew that before I started out. Um, I would say there was a point where, which I describe in the book, where I got lost in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And I got separated, I had a guide with me. I got separated from my guide. I didn't have food or water. It was for a short period. Uh, but there was a moment there where I really had a sense of the terror that these parties yeah. went through. And I remember it was also the first time where I had a sense of the consequences of these expeditions. Mm -hmm. And that these obsessions which could produce very wonderful discoveries um, and Fawcett, in many ways, is very prescient about his mm -hmm. theories of the Amazon. Um, but they can also have real consequences. Mm -hmm. And I remember cursing Fawcett, and I cursed him for Jack, his son, who he led to his death, yeah. something I could never understand. Mm -hmm. I cursed him for Raleigh. I cursed him for all these other people who disappeared. I took out my anger on him. But I had a sense, you know, I had a little kid at the time, and mm -hmm. I kind of said, what the hell am I doing here sure. on this seemingly mad quest? Well, on, on the word of madness, yes. um, your other book, The Devil and Sherlock Holmes, Tales of Murder, Madness, and <laughs> Obsession, yes. I'm starting to notice a little bit of a theme <laughs> yes, in your writing. Yes, it's definitely a little bit of an over, overlapping <laughs> I, theme. Uh, the Miami Herald, I think, when mm. they reviewed the book, someone said that um, you specialize <laughs> in profiling obsessives. Um, can we talk about the other book a little bit? And what is it, what attracts you to a story then? I mean, this book has... Um, you know, literally, a, a death of a, a Sherlock Holmes following expert mm -hmm. and a man who pretends to be a child and mm -hmm. just all these sort of wild and, and wacky people. Yeah. What, um, gets, what gets me? I mean, um, there is a quote from Sherlock Holmes, uh, which I have in there, where he said that life is infinitely stranger uh, than anything which the mind of man could invent. Mm -hmm. And all of these stories somewhat fit that template. Mm -hmm. They are, at some level, great stories. The same with the Lost City of Z. They're just it, they have they are int they are inherently interesting. They have interesting characters. Part of my attraction to obsessive mm -hmm. characters is because they often make the most fascinating characters. And there's a reason why Ahab is one of the most memorable characters in literature, mm -hmm. uh, and why someone like me is not. Um, <laughs> sitting at my desk. But you're now, one of the most memorable writers. <laughs> so there so, you go. <laughs> but there, you know, these people who are driven to do these kind of extraordinary things mm -hmm. outside themselves and are compelled. The other thing that it drew me to these stories, and they are about many, many different yeah. things. Like you said, there's a con man who suddenly suspects he may be the one who is being con. There is this mysterious death of the world's greatest Sherlock Holmes scholar. Mm -hmm. There is a Polish detective. Uh, investigating yeah. whether a postmodern novelist planted clues to an actual murder in his book. Um, there are scientists trying to unravel uh, the mystery um, of this elusive, almost semi-mythological creature, the giant squid, which is <laughs> tentacles as long as 30 feet and 
um, eyes the size of human heads. And, and so, but, but all these stories have, have characters who are often deeply driven, very curious. Um, mm -hmm. What interests me is not just that they're obsessed, but also the, what they're obsessed with. Mm -hmm. In other words, just because someone's an obsessed, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be interesting. But in, the, in these stories, Fawcett, for example, we talked about, he was obsessed with finding an ancient civilization. Well, if an ancient civilization existed in the jungle, in the middle of the Amazon, it would shatter all our preconceived notions about what the Americas and what the jungle looked like mm -hmm. before the arrival of Christopher Columbus. So it had real stakes. Um, and it, it opened up another world. The story about the squid hunters, mm -hmm. these squid hunters searching for these giant squid. Well, they're great characters. But their search for this kind of semi-mythological creature also kind of illuminates the sea, which really remains our last large unexplored area mm -hmm. on Earth today. Um, the postmodern novelist uh, who this Polish detective is investigating opens up a whole world of what is truth um, mm -hmm. and, and into, in, into the intellectual currents of what is postmodern fiction. And this postmodern novelist is playing with truth a lot. Mm -hmm. it, what is real, what is not real. And this novel, and this detective who is an empiricist who believes that facts are facts and a dead body is a dead body has to kind of turn into a postmodernist and decode this novel yeah. and figure out could a novel really have clues to something that is fact mm -hmm. so what is real what is not how do we explain the truth I'd say the other thing that unites yeah. these stories is that in some way all these characters are doing what I think we all do which is they're using the art of detection the powers of observation, mm -hmm. the powers of deduction, to try to understand either themselves, mm -hmm. which is often a mystery, we're often a mystery to ourselves, and the world around them. And they're trying to kind of piece together these narr narratives and make sense uh, of the world around them. And the difference between them and Sherlock Holmes is that they are all mortal, they are all fallible, and they can observe, but they don't necessarily always see. Mm -hmm. And I think that is also what drew me to these stories. They're not fairy tales. They're not fiction. And there's a certain messiness to life that is true and authentic um, that I f makes these stories um, compelling to me, and I hope to the reader. Oh, they're, they're <laughs> wonderful stories. They really are. I mean, my other question that when I was thinking before this interview, I was like, you know, why are you attracted to these stories? And th it, there's an obvious interest mm -hmm. factor. I mean, they're mm -hmm. giant squid hunters. Right. Who doesn't want to get on the right. boat? <laughs> right. um, but it's interesting to hear you talk about how you see this as a vehicle for looking at some larger yes. co uh, concerns. It's a doorway into these. And I think that comes through beautifully yeah. in the essays in this. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of, for example, crime stories in this yeah. book. Yeah. And people ask me, you know, how, why do I choose these stories? You know, there are a million crime stories. I read the tabloids and I read the look at the police mm -hmm. blotters, but most crime stories I wouldn't do. Um, it, just because something is uh, tabloidy or mm -hmm. sensational, uh, I wouldn't necessarily do that. Sorry, all these stories have elements of pulpiness that makes them sure. interesting. Um, they tap into myths and things like that. But usually um, these crime stories help illuminate something else. So. Um, one of the most unsettling stories in this collection of stories is about this man, Cameron Todd Willingham, mm. who was executed in Texas in, 2000, mm -hmm. in 2004 uh, for a fire that uh, allegedly killed his children. And this story, um, it turns out that he may have been innocent, yeah. and it may be the first real clear case uh, in the United States history of a person being executed yeah. who was in fact innocent. It may have happened before, but the evidence in this case is pretty strong and it illuminates in either case, whether he was innocent or not, uh, deep flaws uh, in the judicial system. So it opens up something. It's a door. Uh, it sure. opens up a door and yet it's also um, just a, an enormously heart-wrenching story and you have this woman who befriends him and believes he's innocent and tries to save his life. And so part of it is their story of mm -hmm. their friendship as well. And it, uh, that was a heartbreaking story, mm -hmm. it really is. Um, and as you said, in the, especially the ending of it, which I won't uh, mm -hmm. say, but it was sort of, again, you can't write this, you know, you can't make yeah. this stuff up. And we only have a few, a few seconds or a minute left, but I wanted to say as well that it, it makes sense to me in, in a way, because these are wonderful stories, but um, you, you have to shape them. You know, mm -hmm. they don't just fall in your lap. Yeah. And um, I, 
uh, heard that the three or four of them have already been optioned for he, movies. Yes, a lot of them have been optioned for movies. So we'll be able to see David Grand's yeah. Lost City One, of Z with hope, Brad Pitt. We're hoping that, <laughs> yes, that's what we are certainly hoping. And I think, you know, I think if there is part of that is I do think it is, and I really believe in this, is the power of storytelling. And I believe in the magic of stories. And um, I think these stories are cinematic in nature because at some level they have a certain magic. And I, I think that's less to do with me than the stories. I mean, they, they are um, powerful, compelling stories. And my theory on them, you know, is... I'm going to have to cut yeah. into this. I'm but, so sorry. No, it's just to get out of the way of them and let them tell themselves in a way. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great. Well, it has been a pleasure talking with you. And yeah. thank you for listening, folks. This has been the Visiting Writer Series show. And I've been talking with David Grant today. Thank you.